Good morning. I'm Command Sergeant Major Retired Phil Jondro, and today I'll be talking to you about the strategic force, the classroom, and the battlefield. And I want to start you off with a little bit of background about myself. I spent over 33 years of service. I was one of the finalists for the most senior enlisted positions in the United States Army as a senior enlisted advisor. I've served the brigade, division, and corps level as a senior enlisted advisor in both peacetime and combat. I spent 42 months deployed. I received four Bronze Star Medals, one for Valor and ARCOM for Valor. And I started my education while I was actually deployed in Iraq in one of the toughest fightings there. And it took me four years to go from my associate's degree to my master's degree. The agenda briefly I'll be covering is the battlefield, the classroom, creating top talent, your role as a CLO, and discussion. The battlefield. When I first started looking at continuing my education, when I was the first cavalry division command sergeant major and the multinational division Baghdad command sergeant major in Iraq. And what you are is you're a senior enlisted advisor to a two-star general. And during this time, this was the largest formation ever assembled under one division headquarters in the United States Army. And what theoretically that tells you is that from 20,000 soldiers, it went normal in division, we had 100,000 soldiers, and it was an astronomical task to be able to come upon yourself. But if the rigors of combat of doing patrols 18 hours a day, I thought, how can I find myself to be able to decompress? And I thought being able to pull myself in the rigors of combat, looking at something completely different, decompressing, thinking outside of the box, and also creating my critical thinking skills, I thought education was the key. And as I talked to my leadership and some of my peers there, they agreed with me 100% this was a great way to start. And for the last reason I want to do it is I wanted to set the example to my soldiers that you need to continue to improve yourself and work towards the lifelong learning process. Now the battlefield. Now just as you are as a, a learning operation officer, you have different tasks, you have different problems and things that you have to deal with and use your critical thinking skills. For instance, um, if you're still creating the keep top talent within your organization, but your budget is limited. These complex problems that I dealt with in combat are similar, but many of them, people's lives were actually at risk at all times. And one of the issues that I've dealt with was you had the improvised explosive device, what we call the IED. Now this device was a explosive device that would explode and catastrophically destroy vehicles. Well, at a certain time, these things became more sophisticated and more lethal. And eventually, they came out with an explosive force projectile, which was very lethal. It actually had a shaped charge that burned through the vehicle and destroyed everybody inside the vehicle. And so we knew that we had to do something quick to stop this. And actually, how this worked was they would arm the device. There would be an IR beam. The vehicle would pass through the beam, break the beam, it would trigger a device and explode inside the crew compartment. So we knew we had to come up with a way quickly to be able to deter them from being able to do signature this device. So what I did was I sat down and said, there's got to be a way to do this because people's lives are at risk. And I know we were held by the nation to be able to take care of our greatest treasure, our sons and daughters. And so it was at the utmost critical that we'd be able to deal with this. So I went ahead and got a team together to leadership and we discussed what could we do. And I thought as a little kid, I used to remember a train with a cow catcher on the front and it would kind of knock the cow off the tracks. I said, well, if we could get something in front of the vehicle that would be able to break the beam prematurely, then this device would not be able to explode and hit the compartment or maybe just disable a vehicle. So I got my mechanics together because they're the technical experts and said, how do we devise something like this? And then they came back and said, hey, we've got a bar we can put out in front, we can put a device out in front in the vehicle, it'll break the beam, and it'll destroy maybe the front of the vehicle, not destroy the vehicle at all, but the crew compartment will be saved. I said, perfect. Okay, now what do we have in theater that we can use? But you can't ride home and get this stuff. So you have to use it from within you have it in a the theater. So we found out, well, we have engineer stakes, which are about three feet high, that we could put out front. We had plenty of ammo cans that we could put ammo cans, weld them to the front, and go ahead and make that as your IED defeating device. So we tested it, it worked perfectly. Okay, now the next problem is, how do we prioritize who gets them? The first people that are going outside the camp, the first ones going in the harm's way, they need them today, they need them right now. 
Also, how do we mass produce them? We have to get them on hundreds of vehicles now. So now we have to go ahead and look for a way to mass produce them. We have to have 24 hours of shift work of where we're able to get this device on the vehicle and be able to utilize it the way you have designed it. So we were able to go ahead and come up with a solution, get it on the vehicle, and then the next thing is when you drive outside the compound and go to the locals, they want to know what's this new device you got on there, what's this? And you know if you tell them, eventually it's going to get to the insurgents and they're going to go ahead and counter it and think of another way to defeat that device. So we told them, ah, oh, it's a weather machine, it's a barometric pressure, it tells us how much dust is in the air. We made up complex different stories to kind of throw them off. But eventually we knew that they would figure out exactly what was on it. The next issue that I dealt with, um, but there were so many, was these two young ladies here that you see in your upper left hand corner. This is Afra and Lena Alasadi. These two young ladies were Iraqi interpreters. We could not do our job without these young ladies being able to translate what our discussions were. They were force multipliers out there on the battlefield. They were as brave as most men I have seen. They would face the same dangers that we did every day and come in willingly and stand side by side with us because they wanted to make a difference in their country. They wanted to make it better. They wanted to make it free because they knew what we had in the United States. They had already tried to kill these girls once. And I left as a brigade star major and the way I got to know them was I was looking for somebody else on camp. And I was asking them questions of the person I was looking for them. And they, two sisters were kind of arguing and one would say why and one would say because. So that's how I knew them. The older one was why and the young one was because. And for a year that's how I knew them. Where's why and because? How are they doing? And it was kind of funny because I, I didn't put names to them initially. But as I got to know them and I seen the bravery that these girls had and I seen the trials and tribulations they went through along with us, I knew it was important. They tried to kill these girls a second time. And what they did was they followed them off post. They f ran the car off the road. It flipped. It caught on fire. The insurgents saw it because of the condition of the vehicle. They obviously were dead. And they left. Well, they got the girls out of the vehicle. One burned her back and one uh, broke her ankle. But they were okay. I knew at that moment that I had to do something to save these girls' lives because they had stuck by us and we were going to stick by them. And I knew then I had to come up and use the critical thinking skills that I had to figure out a way to do. I had no idea how I was going to do it, but I had to figure out something. I did some research. I did asking my staff. I asked people around me, and I found out there was a program where they were letting some Iraqis leave Iraq and go to America and get their green card and eventually try and become citizens. But they were only letting 50 people out of the country. Well, 60 Minutes did a documentary on it, and uh, from the documentary, they actually opened up to 500 people, and I knew this was my opportunity. These girls had to go through background checks, they had to go through security checks, fingerprints, etc. So we got the paperwork started, and within a day or two, five more workers were killed. They came off the camp, they rounded them up, they zip stripped them, uh, took them under the 14 July bridge and executed them. And they found out that these girls were still alive. So they were looking for them within the town. They were having to sleep at a different house every night to try and um, keep away from these guys. So I knew that I had to push this paperwork through because at the time it was at a certain level where it was going to take two or three months to still get through the wickets. And I knew we didn't have that kind of time. So I went and I found the paperwork. I took it up to the division headquarters. I knocked on the general's door and walked in and asked the general that you have to sign this paperwork. And um, he looked at me and asked one question, do you trust him? And I said, with my life. And uh, he knew by looking at me, I was never going to let anybody hurt them girls again. And I get emotional about that because it's an emotional business. And if you're not emotional, you've probably got to find something else to do. But I knew I was going to take care of them. And I got it through the wickets. Those girls were actually able to go to Turkey and uh, couldn't even take their clothes with them. And my next problem was they have to have a sponsor. Well, I'm their sponsor. I'm still in Iraq for eight more months. How am I going to take care of them? So now I have to call my mother on the phone and said, Mom, somebody's coming home for dinner. Um, two girls you've never met. They, they speak pretty good English. And my mom's like, really? And my mom stood up to the plate and said, you know what? I understand this is important to you. Then I will take them in. I didn't know how the community would take them in because they were Iraqis. Because some people think they're Iraqis. We're in Iraq. We're fighting Iraq. They're enemy. But they're anything from that. They're patriots. They're not enemy at all. But the community wrapped their arms around them and took care of them. 
And they went from being in Baghdad, Iraq, to Montana, where it's 125 degrees and it's hot, hot, and hotter with one climate, where they went to two climates in Montana, where it's winter on the 4th of July. But they got jobs. I got called by a Vietnam vet that said, I will make sure that they get jobs because we didn't take care of people like I thought we should have when I was in Vietnam. And they were part of the community. And as you see them, they were my family heirs. As you look up in the top right, their new family. And as you look up there and they see with the American flags, these girls, after four years, we kept in contact. They took the naturalization test. And I happened to be in California when they were getting ready to take the oath of, uh, of the citizenship. The university was gracious enough to let me fly up there. I flew up there and I was able to be there as they sworn in as American citizens. And it was such a proud moment to be able to stand there with them and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. It was so moving. And they usually don't even let cameras into the federal courthouse, but they made a condition that they were able to do that, and that's us with the judge there, because this was such a, a, a overwhelming story for the community, and they felt so good about help, everybody that helped these girls through the five years that they were there to get to where they were to be American citizens. And now they've thrived. They're going to college. Um, Lena's working to be an accountant. And uh, it just makes you proud and inspirational to know these young ladies and what patriots they really, truly are. The battlefield, my classroom, it, it was a JLA chess match every day with what you did with the enemy. Like I told you the story about the rhino. Once they found out about the rhino, well, then they put a two-second delay on it. So it would still hit the crew compartment. It would wait two seconds when it broke the beam and hit the crew compartment. So then we had to extend it out even further. Well, then they figured that one out. So then we brought it in. So we had four different ways you could put the rhino on. Well, you don't put it on at all. You put it out a little bit, medium, or all the way out. So it was a constant guessing game between them and us of how it was going to be in that particular day. You had to keep your critical thinking skills to stay ahead. We know the sharpest and the most important weapon on the battlefield is our soldiers. We have to keep them sharpened, just like we sharpen our bayonet. The continuous assessment to go inside of our adversary's head, to get inside their decision-making cycle, to throw them off loop, to be pro proactive instead of being reactive. And the battlefield, we know the battlefield demands an agile, balanced, and creative and critical thinker. My classroom, well, my classroom was a battlefield. 18 hours a day I was on patrol, but I had to find a university that would work with me of what I needed to do because we all know as CLOs, leadership development is the most important thing that we do. And we have to continue to develop ourselves and set the example for our peers. So I had to find a university that was flexible enough for me to be able to work within my hours and within my distance of not being with a university because I thought I could only do a brick and mortar classroom. But I found out quickly I didn't need that. I could do it myself. I could figure it out. I got more out of it. I was Phi Kappa Bata where you were I, uh, the International Honor Society for a two-year college with a 4.0 GPA, so I knew I had good memorization skills. I had been to every non-commissioned officer education school in the United States Army. But I knew reading, studying, memorizing, passing, and flushing didn't get it for me. I needed a robust learning model that challenged me. The university I went to challenged me to be able to do that. It gave me complex problems, real-world problems, where I was able to take them, do the research, come out with my assessment, and then defend my assessment on what I did, and that's what I was looking for. Creating top talent, the educated veteran employee, responsibility that the veterans have is at a much higher level than anybody else. But uh, many of them that have been in for 10, 20, 30 years, that's all they've ever known. It's a big transition to go into corporate America. They wear a uniform every day. They look good in it, but they wear the uniform every day. For myself, I had to, it was like gr animals. I had to label my jacket, my pants, my shirt, my tie. Okay, ones go at ones, twos goes with twos, threes goes with threes. Until I could finally find out the whole color coordinate. Still haven't completely got it, but I'm still working at it. And they're task and delivery oriented. They're about mission focus, about getting things done. And their leadership is tested in some of the harshest environments you will ever see in the world. They're teamwork and, and, uh, oriented and they're dedicated. They're about getting the mission done and do what they have to do. The way that we look at things in the military is we have what we call an AAR process, an action, after action review. And what we do is we don't focus so much on what we did well, we focus on how we can do things better and continue to work and, and get better in our organization. And they live to make a difference. They want to be a part of something larger than themselves. 
your role as a chief learning operating officer. Don't, you're just not hiring vets. You're transitioning them. You're helping them to make that transition from the Americans to the corporate America from the Army. This is a big challenge that you'll have to do to be able to help them. You have to find that right people to help them make that transition. Because I said earlier, all they've known is military life. The jargon that they use, the things that they look at that are different for you and different from them. You have to find the right people that know that. I am a coach for um, active duty and retired militaries. I am a senior mentor at the School of Command Preparation at Fort Leavenworth where I go up there three times a year as a volunteer and I go up there and I help mentor them and give back in a different capacity and I talk to them about the transition process and how you have to plan that transition process and how you have to help them with that process because everything we do in the Army we plan to prepare. When we plan to prepare to make the transition to corporate America we don't do as well of a job as we should. We need your help being able to do that and you have to partner with the right university for adult learners. You have to be able to challenge them because they want to be challenged. They want to be able to utilize their critical thinking skills to become better at what they do. And lastly, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank you. When I was in uniform, I used to go to the airport all the time, and I'd have people that come up to me and thank me for what I did. And I used to be amazed. I said, well, why are you thanking me? Well, we're going to thank you because you serve our country. And I used to say, you know what? I want to thank you. I want to thank you because you're an American taxpayer, and you pay me to do exactly what I want to do. I am a United States soldier. I am proud of what I do and defend this country. And you help me be able to live that dream by supporting me. I know America's not perfect. We might not always get it right. But we did not become the greatest country in the world by accident. We earned it by the men and women that have shed their blood, sweat, and tears before us. And with you in this room, that help support them to be able to do the job that they needed to do. You supported the warrior on the battlefield. And for that, I want to thank you.